You're listening to Arts Express. This is Prairie Miller, and next up on the show, actress Karen Condajan turned to writing to capture on the page a woman who fascinated her, namely Charlie Parkhurst, a late 19th century Wild West stagecoach driver who chose to live her life as a man, and Condajan is here to tell us why, as depicted in her imaginatively lyrical novel, The Whip, and in essence about Charlie Parkhurst, how the woman inside her died in anguish in a hollow world, also what Tennessee Williams, Ed Harris, Art Linkletter, and Jack Kerouac have to do with what has inspired her creatively in her own life. First, here's Karen Condajan reading some passages from the novel. Well, I thought I'd read two brief parts from from the book. The last section I'll be reading is great fun because it's a few rules from a list that Wells Fargo required all the stagecoach uh, passengers to read. It's actually um, <laughs> it's actually very good advice on how to survive your next stagecoach ride. But right now, I want to start with something more serious. This section takes place in 1848 in Rhode Island. It's right after the main character, Charlie Parkhurst, or Charlotte Parkhurst has has suffered the horrendous loss of her family. To track the killer, she's put on the guise of of a man. Charlotte rode down the main street of Providence. Byron's old hat pulled low over her forehead. She rode past Mrs. Bidwell's boarding house and the bookstore. She rode past Bronson's general store. Mr. Bronson was opening the shutters of the horse and its rider. He noticed nothing out of the ordinary. He glanced up at the click-clocking, and then his eyes slid back down to his hands, fastening the shutters on the pesky hooks under the clapboard. The horse had looked inconsequential. The rider had looked inconsequential. The hooves clopped in the usual way. She tried to take this all in, that the woman in her had died in anguish, an eventful man had been born in, in her place, apparently brooked no, no notice of the universe. Nor had the universe even blinked in the absorption into itself of her tragedy. It was astonishing to her that the sun had re-risen and shone down on them, all in the same way as always before. That the townspeople weren't transfixed in shock, dumbfounded, changed outright at the death of the old world, and the hollow, hopeless replacement offered in exchange. But no, their lives seemed to be moving on as usual. Charlotte looked around her in dismay. The townspeople were, all of them, just the same as any other day. How could that be? She rode on past the crumbling brick buildings and the peeling white houses. Everything was temporary. She understood that now. All of this was temporary. It would be snatched away. It was all on loan. Even the people we love, they were all on loan. One day you see their face across the table, or you pass them hurrying from here to there, or you see them leave you in your bed, and their profile passes you by, and and you don't know. Your thought's somewhere else, and then snatched away from you forever and you did not know to say goodbye you did not know it was going to be a bracing autumn day the leaves were glimmering in the early light they'd been turning crisp in the cold nights and rattled now in the breeze they were orange gold and red in her old life she might have called it glorious But now she knew the truth about all this beauty. Well, that's part one. And the last part, um, this has a little more humor in it. Um, It's about the stagecoach rules. Number one, abstinence from liquor is requested. If you must drink, share the bottle. To do otherwise makes you appear selfish and unneighborly. If ladies are present, 
gentlemen are urged to forego smoking cigars and pipes as the odor of the same is repugnant to the gentle sex. Chewing tobacco is permitted, but spit with the wind, not against it. Buffalo robes are provided for your comfort during cold weather. Hogging robes will not be tolerated, and the offender will be made to ride with the driver. Firearms may be kept on your person for use in emergencies. Do not fire them for pleasure or shoot at wild animals as the sound riles the horses. In the event of a runaway horse, remain calm. Leaping from the coach in panic will, will leave you injured and at the mercy of the elements, hostile Indians, and hungry wolves. If the team runs away, sit still and take your chances. Forbidden topics of discussion are stagecoach robberies and Indian uprisings. Also, don't discuss politics or religion, nor point out places on the road where horrible murders have been committed. Gents guilty of unseemly behavior toward lady passengers will be put off the stage. It's a long walk home. A word to the wise is sufficient. And finally, the last rule is Expect annoyance, discomfort, and some hardships. If you're disappointed, thank heavens. <laughs> That's the end of the stagecoach rules. That was lovely. Thank you so much for reading for our listeners. And I have some questions for you, Karen. Your life passion and work has been acting, so why the switch to novelist? Well, actually, I haven't switched. I'm still acting, but... You know, I have a theory that actors are, could be uh, really wonderful writers because we go through the same process, which I didn't realize when I was writing, um, that writers go through, which is that you have to do backstory. Um, the thing that actors are good at is, of course, improvising. Um, you know, you take a scene, you're given a premise, as an actor, and you have to improvise around it. Well, writing is, is ultimately the same thing. You take your character, you put it in a situation, and you write about it, you improvise around it. The other thing is, is actors are athletes of the emotions. We are taught how to use our emotions, and that's a really good thing, as, of course, as a writer, because you're able to access your feelings and and sometimes I just rode wrote on the feelings and it was it felt like it was almost being channeled. So I I found this great story, um and I wrote about it. It's my debut novel and I I think also I would like to say if if anyone is interested in writing that you have to have a real passion and you have to have some real, what's the word, it's a commitment to, because it took me six years and 27 drafts to write the book. And why for your first venture into writing a story about a real person about whom so little is known and what is known has been debated? Well, it's not, oh, you mean, uh, yes, she, she actually did leave, live. <laughs> I, I, in fact, my first book signing was a, about a mile from her grave, which was in Watsonville, California. Um, I think you were saying debated. I think everything in history is debated. Um, and you're right. There are many, they say one thing about her, and then someone else in history says something else about her. But it is fairly true that she was probably the first woman to vote in America as a man. They have her name actually in her hand, a document. Um, she did apparently kill the famous outlaw Sugarfoot, who robbed his stagecoach one too many times. And when she died, they didn't know she was a woman until they got her ready for her funeral. So all the doctors came from all over, Santa Cruz, California, and all the various close cities. And when they looked at her and did a semi-autopsy, she had had a child. So I took 
all these facts. I mean, she had been such a famous stagecoach driver that it was very shocking. Uh, she, she was one of the three top male stagecoach drivers, and then suddenly she turned out to be, you know, a woman. Mm. So I took all these facts, and then I, I improvised, as you would say, around around her, and created what I would hope or imagine the story of what what made her come to California. And what led to your fascination with this particular woman as your protagonist of choice? When I was a, a how I kind of discovered this this woman is um, when I was in my twenties, which was a while ago. Um, I used to read Cosmopolitan magazine, <laughs> mm. how to how to get a man. Oh. So. Um, uh, one of the articles was, uh, I think it was called something like um, Women of the Wild West. And I remember reading about this woman, and it fascinated me. I thought, first of all, I didn't realize that so many women lived their lives as men in that period of time, because you only had a few choices, a mother, a prostitute, a, if you had a little education teacher, um, that was about it. And if you had a lot of guts, you know, you could be a nurse out in the fields during the war. But that was it. You had men. Men were the only ones who could have dreams, not women. And so when I came across this character, I thought, first of all, how in the world did she cover herself for 30 years? How did she not get discovered? It fascinated me. I thought to myself, uh, you know, how did simple things like <laughs> how did she pee on the trail with all these macho guys? How did she? Yeah. Um, how did she? How did she have her period? Pardon? How did she <laughs> go to the I bathroom? I know that, that you know there are these questions. How did she have her period? I mean, for some women, that's a very uncomfortable time of the month. How did she cover her body? Um, her face. How is it that that these these men didn't look at her and go, God, you look pe peculiar, you know, because she was a straight woman, as far as we know, um, because, as I say, she had had a child. Um, so this would have been a, not a feminine woman, and I'm sure if I were playing, if I were being her, any of us taking on the guise of another sex, you know, you, I guess what, I would have dirtied my face. You know, she sat up there and most of the stagecoach drivers probably did have dirty faces, so that could have taken care of the the whiskers. But the rest of that, I I don't know. And yeah, so, and in those days, most men or all men had beards, if not mustaches. Yes, you're right. And they did have longer hair. Yeah. They sorry. What were you going to say? I said and sideburns. Yes, yeah. they had longer hair, which is one thing. But you're absolutely right about that, and so. I guess, you know, some of the, look, the stagecoach drivers were considered the rock stars of their times. Mm. And so some of them were a little peculiar, I would imagine. <laughs> it, it, it's true. And some of them were drunks. And, you know, I think maybe they all allowed for eccentricity. Mm. So probably that's how they thought Charlie was just a little eccentric. But, you know, the other thing that I always wonder is, you know, 30 years of not having really anyone close in your life or having anyone touch you or or any kind of intimacy at all that whether it is as a you know a conversation or a friend she had to probably hold herself back all the time she had to probably you know imagine that if you're a man listening to this and you're and you're having to to be a woman or vice versa i'm sure that was a very difficult thing. And what did you have in mind for readers to understand about Charlie Parkhurst? And what led her to make the difficult and complicated choice to live her life as a man? Well, I don't want to spoil the story because that's a, a very big moment yeah. in the story. There are, I have, hopefully, you know, a couple of surprises in the book. But I will say this. Um, the, undergr it, 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 the underground river that runs through this book, the theme, if you will, is 
if someone destroyed horribly everything that you love in this life, everyone, everything, could you forgive them? And if not, how far might you go? So, you know, there's a lot. I, I said, I, when I was writing this, I was thinking of 9 11. I was thinking of genocide. I was thinking of people who've had horrible losses, just snatched their lives, just snatched away, swallowed whole people's lives. And that's really the theme of this book. It's can this woman forgive? And if not, what will she do? How far will she go? And at the same time, little has been said about her possibly really more dangerous decision to enter into an interracial relationship, something that could have gotten her killed at the time. What do you make of that, that there's so little speculation in the public record about that? Yes, yes. I just think she was a very ballsy woman who took her life in her hands and she fell in love and did not let she you know she was raised in an orphanage so much of our each of our backgrounds is is shaped of course by our parents and the the, the family that we live in and she lived in one of those terrible kind of orphanages that they did in the early 1800s so i'm sure you know she was a total free spirit mm. and went with her heart yeah. which is a good lesson for all of us mm. you know in a sense I, i'm i'm talking about um living life sculpting our own lives following our hearts which is sometimes hard in this world because you know we have families we have jobs if we're lucky <laughs> in this day and age, you know, but, but somehow to, to not die with our, our song still in our hearts. And she certainly didn't die with her song still in her heart. Now, Karen, what did you think of the film that came out this past year with a very similar theme, Albert Knobs, and how would you compare and contrast the choices of these two women to live their lives secretly as men? Well, there is a big difference. Albert Knobs, uh, first of all, is not a true story. It's, it's, right. you know, it's so but it's based on women yes. who may have lived like yes. that in Ireland. Yes, yes. That, that was in Ireland, and, and she was trying to keep her job. That, I mean, she was trying to have a job, live a life, make money for herself. Um, my character, or Charlie Parkhurst, Charlotte Charlie Parkhurst, um, was out, in a sense, for revenge. Now, we know in those days, in the 1800s, women could not really travel. So, I mean, there was always the risk of being raped or something. So I would imagine a lot of women put on their men's britches just, just to travel. Um, and, in fact, I was going to just say this. There was an interesting woman I discovered who was a soldier during, in the Confederate Army. And she survived. No one ever discovered that she was a woman. And she went home and had three children. Um, so there were quite a few women that did that. And but, what was her name? Um, her name was, it was Loretta. Loretta Velasquez, I think it, it was. That was it. Just came to me. Ah. Loretta Vasquez. Um, she was a, a character. Um, there was a woman who was the, one of the head doctors during the Civil War that nobody knew. And she was a woman. It goes on and on. It's astonishing. Also, I wanted to know in terms of how concealing their identities, Albert Nobbs and Charlie Parker. Oh, yes. Did Back you notice Albert any Nobbs. similarities, differences? Yeah. Um, Charlie, you know, was a character and drank and smoked cigars and uh, lived out loud, as, as you would say. I think Albert Nobbs was, you know, 180 degrees. Yeah. Um, she was like a mouse and didn't want anyone to even hardly know that she existed. So there was a difference totally in the personality. And the jobs also required that kind of demeanor. Uh, being a butler, you fade into the wallpaper. Hmm. Whereas Charlie was this very wild... I mean, she she died of tongue cancer from drinking too much and, as I say, 
smoking too many cigars and chewing tobacco. So and and she was very wild and she had terrible language and I guess she just she was, as I say, the personality was 180 degrees. Yeah. And unfortunately, poor Glenn Close, who, by the way, I'm so thrilled for her that she was able to finally make one of her dreams come true to play the role mm. in a film. You know, her character had to be like a mouse. Yeah. So she was not able, she had to play very subtle work, which, you know, she's a great actress and did very well. But it, I think, you know, it's always those characters. The, the, the outgoing ones that capture an audience. Karen, in what ways would you say the life and struggles of Charlie Parkhurst mirror some of your own in terms of the difficulties of being a woman in this world? Very good question. Um, because actually I'm very lucky. I, I, I've Since I was eight years old, I've been an actor. Um, so actors are allowed to be to live their lives really, you know, uh, in their own peculiar way. Uh, whereas uh, uh, um, I was reading in the paper yesterday something about I think women uh, were paid are paid were paid seventy seven percent less than men. Um, oh, that would have been in 2010. That's right. They did some research in 2010. Women were paid 77% less than, you know, than men uh, in many jobs, in many jobs. And that's, I, that blew me away. Hmm. I, I think we're still, all of us, uh, still we live in a male world, don't you agree? Well, even not just as an actress, but outside of the acting world, the difficulties of being a woman in this world for you. Did you identify with her in any sense? Well, I'm a free spirit. Hmm. Um, I, I've been fortunate in my life to live the way that I've, I've, I've wished to live, hmm. even though I didn't live in an orphanage. Um, so that's a similarity. Um, I just identified with her in terms of, of, I guess it's what I said before. I, I'm a big, I, I'm a big fan of, you know, living your dreams and putting your arms around life now, not putting things off until tomorrow, because you know, as we all know, sometimes tomorrow is very doesn't come, or it's very different than what we thought it might be. So I'm, you know, obviously the rock star of her time was as close to being an actor. Um, I'm very lucky that I still have that profession. Um, and I, I never married. I've had a lot of wonderful men in my life, but I've never married. And in a way, I think that's one of my rebellious choices. And not, I've always felt kind of that marriage is a little bit of being in a prison, you know, mm. even in this day and age. And so, you know, I'm going to have to look at that. Thank you for the question. Oh, okay. I never really thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you feel your approach and scrutiny of Charlie Parker's differs from a male perspective and how a man might have written this novel differently from a male point of view? Well, I tell you, a lot. I've had, I've asked a lot of men who've read this book. Mm. Does it feel very feminine to you? Is it? And and it, and they go, no, not at all. First of all, the book has a lot of language, like Deadwood. You know, mm. I've used, I've used all that language. That's and you know, a man. To answer your question, I know a man would have done the same, um, because it's authentic. That's number one. Number two. Um, I would say that I, there's a lot of violence in it, in my book, and men tend to like violence. <laughs> um, I, you know, I wrote I wrote the book for, for both sexes, hopefully, um, and and I didn't do it like, okay, what would a man like? I just simply was trying to be authentic, and it was such a man's world then, so I tried to recreate that that so that the reader would feel like what it was to live in that time women just were you know it was just a terrible plight to be born a woman then unless you had a lot of money and still you couldn't live your dreams but at least you could travel you know with your family or such um we're so lucky now as women 
to to have choices, and we can live our dreams now. And how did you go about immersing yourself in that time period and picking up the flavor of the time? Mm. I did, well, as I say, it took me six years to write the book, so there was a lot of research, a lot. Um, I didn't, you know, I tried not to watch movies so much, or, or even, I would never even watched um Deadwood until later after the book was written I I got the HBO the series that was on Netflix and watched the whole thing but I didn't want to kind of copy mythology you know there's so much myth about the west the old west so I just did a, read a, uh, many many books and one of the things that was difficult was the language meaning I don't mean the bad language I mean the the um I'll give you an example. I had to look up in the dictionary many, many words to see if they even existed then. For for instance, the word okay. That word did not come into existence until mid-1800. And apparently it was a compilation of an Indian word that sounded like okay, and they took it on. So I had to be very careful looking up many words. So it was very tedious, the research, um, finding out what kinds of locks are on doors, and the different gun that suddenly had now appeared at that time, the clothes, the food, um, the, the, the underwear. I had to, you know, that was actually very hard to find. Yes, they had little skirts and drawers, but, you know, the, the specific underclothes that the men wore, the women wore, it was a mighty experience to have to do that. that that's how I did it. It was research. It, it's just a very difficult job. Karen, on another note, you've had quite a distinguished career in acting, and there's a fascinating story behind your relationship with Tennessee Williams. Tell the listeners about that. Oh, my God, you've done wonderful research. <laughs> well, there was a moment in my life when... I almost died, and my parents knew that I had always wanted to play the role of Serafina Della Rosa in Tennessee Williams' Rose Tattoo. And that was a film, by the way, with Anna Magnani many years ago. Um, so they gave me some money, actually, and said, produce it. Well, I had never produced anything in my life, so we started rehearsing. I didn't even know you're supposed to get the rights to a play. <laughs> I did get them, finally. The production came on uh, in a way that surprised me. It was very successful. We, I, won the L.A. Drama Critics Circle Award. Tennessee Williams happened to be in town at that time that the play was on, and a friend said, what do you want for your birthday? And I laughed and teased and said, Tennessee Williams. Mm -hmm. The next thing I know, my friend, who had a lot of connections, had Tennessee uh, put him in a limousine and brought him to the theater. Um, it was an amazing experience because I thought to myself backstage before I walked on, if I can survive this, I can survive anything. Anyway, he saw the show. He loved it. He liked me very much. Um... He gave me the rights to all his plays while he was alive. So later I did a play, Sweet Bird of Youth, which was not available at the time in Los Angeles. Um, I called his agent, Billy Barnes, who was a very lovely agent at the time. It was Tennessee's agent. And um, he gave me the rights. And a young man, just starting out his career, played Chance Wayne, lovely, wonderful actor named Ed Harris, <laughs> who um, was brilliant and still is, of course. <laughs> and um, um, it was 1980-81 that we did it. There was no nudity, um, really, on in the theater, and our director decided to have the beginning of the play a, a working shower. And out of the steam, uh, at the first moment in the play, walked the naked Ed Harris. Well, <laughs> it was 
it was a, a beautiful sight to behold. And we always waited five, five or ten seconds while we heard audiences rumbling around, and we'd hear a man going, get up. And we'd hear a woman, no, no, I want to stay. Get up. And then we'd hear a man and a woman or leave. It was that, imagine that. That wasn't so long ago. And it was so shocking uh, to the audiences then. Anyway, it turned out to be very successful. And he and I, thank God, are, are still friends. And you started out as a child on television with Art Linkletter. What was that all about? Oh, <laughs> yes. I was in school in Los Angeles, and I was eight years old, and some group of people came, and they were, you know, interviewing all the different children that were, the teacher said, to talk to. I guess it was all the eccentric children, the ones who would say anything, which I guess was me. Anyway, I got on the show, and... At this point, I had wanted to be a spy. Mm -hmm. And before the show, they gave us a beautiful lunch of all the, all the grilled cheese sandwiches and orange sherbet I wanted in a restaurant. So I told Art Linkletter on the show that I did not want to be a spy anymore. I wanted to be an actress because I got to miss school and have all the grilled cheese and sandwiches and orange sherbet, and, and, and that was it. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, well, all right, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> And do you know, it's interesting. At the age of eight, I made that decision, and I never wavered. I was, I went to school in England. I was l lucky to, you know, study drama in England and, and University of Vienna and lots of wonderful places. Mm. And uh, that, imagine that. I guess it was the grilled cheese sandwiches and the oh. orange sherbet. <laughs> uh, what's next for you? Well, um, there's a possible play coming up, which um, until we get the rights, you know, I'm not going to talk about in L.A. And then, but I'm writing a, a, I am in the process of writing another book called Looking for Jack Kerouac. Mm -hmm. And why I called it that is that when I was 13 years old, I lived in San Francisco and I had long hair and I used to carry my guitar everywhere. And I, I used to go to the City Lights bookstore and, and try to find Jack Kerouac because I was in love with him, as I think every woman, girl was. And um, they'd say, oh, he's across the street. So I'd go across the street and he wasn't there. And they'd say, oh, he's over at this restaurant. I'd go over there. Well, it seemed like all my life I was looking for Jack Kerouac. Mm -hmm. And it's a good thing I didn't find him because he loved 13-year-old girls. And what that showed me over and over again in my life was that sometimes you want something in your life and you don't get it, and it's because you're protected. And so the theme of, of this book of mine is it's going to be a fictionalized memoir because I've been so fortunate to meet and be uh, friends with so many interesting people. But I want to fictionalize it. I don't want anyone to really know, <laughs> although I'm admitting it, um, that it's me. Um, I'm going to take a wonderful character and, and weave it through the life. But as I say, it's, the, the theme of the book is that actually we're all protected, even when we don't get the things we want. And that's an interesting coincidence because there's a film coming out on the road starring British actor Sam Riley and I believe Kirsten Dunst. Mm, so, right. Yeah. You're right. And I, I you know, it's going to take me a long time for this book to finish, but uh, yeah. I I think a lot of younger people don't know who Jack Kerouac was. You know, he was this hot, sexy guy who I guess was a big drug addict and wrote a lot on I'm, I I was reading recently that he had this 120-page, he put in a typewriter a roll of paper. And he was heavy into method, I don't know, some kind of drug, God knows what, some upper. And, um, and that he just kept typing. He spent something like um, almost 24 hours typing this roll of paper without stopping on these drugs, and that they just auctioned off, I think a year ago, this roll of On the Road. It was On the Road that he had typed in this mad uh, drug frenzy. Or On the Roll. 
on the road. It was on, oh, the, on road. the roll. <laughs> on the <laughs> roll. <laughs> on the roll. You're very funny. <laughs> so you have nothing coming up. On the screen, big screen, little screen, nothing at this point. Well, I haven't been. I, I in the last two years, I really, I haven't really done much work mm. because I, I was dedicated and yeah. determined to finish the book. So, you know, that's one of the things is that you, you, it's very hard when you leave the book for even a week or two, mm. and so I, to be, I, I did not. No, I haven't done anything in the last couple of years, but now. Now that the book is published and on its feet, and I'm hoping we'll fly, um, and maybe even hopefully be a movie. I, uh, yeah. There's little bites here and there. Um, I'm going to start acting again. And that was Karen Condasian talking about her novel, The Whip, out from Hanson Publishing. <laughs> 